Don't you realize Jesus is your physical trainer? And he is saying to you, you don't need less resistance. You just need to apply the resistance in different ways. Don't stop the workout. Just work on the other things that are weak in your life so that that can pr prove stronger. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Here's the three principles of how to get godly wisdom. First, admit you need God in others. Now, he uses the phrase in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom. Now, he's kind of being a bit polite here, right? Because if any of you lacks wisdom, he's like saying all of you lack wisdom, you know. It's kind of like sometimes when someone be like, do you, baby, do you, do you need a tissue? They're like, please take this tissue. If someone offers you a mint, <laughs> take the mint, take the mint. Just take it. Just be safe. Take the mint. They might be being nice. Take it. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. Because you see, one of the key principles in Proverbs is if you think you're wise, you might be a fool. If you think you've arrived and you know everything there is to know about everything, that's when you are the one in the room that doesn't know enough. It's not asking any questions. Like, you have a system in your mind about how life will work, right? Like, it's simple. Like, okay, I do good things, and good things happen to me. And then, like, reality happens, and that doesn't always work. And then you go, well, what do I do now? How do I figure that out? Well, again, Job <laughs> has something to say that could help you with that. But here's the other thing. You don't admit that you need God. This comes through the scriptures. There's a plethora of incredible verses about every area of life in the scripture. But also remembering that community is a important part. That's why we need to admit that we need God and others. Don't be like that person that's like, look, it's just God and me, and we're just rolling through the world by ourselves. That gets you in trouble. Because as we were praying about, uh, as Pastor Josh led us in prayer during our prayer time in the mornings, and we looked at Jeremiah where it says the heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. Who can know it? Like, don't you know that sometimes you trick yourself into thinking you're doing something for the right reasons when you're really not? But you know who can help you with that? Somebody else who see? Somebody else that's like, mm -mm, that ain't why you're doing this. There's a deeper motive involved. And so community is what God has given us as well to help us understand how to work and how, what to do in a key moment. Because we can trick ourselves into thinking the opposite is true of what we want because, you know, that's what we want at the moment because our hearts are deceitful at times. Some of you are not dealing with life because you're so sure you know how life should go. It's not about the event of the circumstance. It's how you interpret the event. And you might be crushed because you think you know how to handle it, but you're handling it completely wrong. Admit that you need help from God and others. Second, believe God will help you. Right? He says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let them ask God, but let them ask, excuse me, in faith, believing that God will actually offer and do. And this is, you know, it's a very dark place to be when you believe that there is a God, but you believe he has no interest in helping you. And so many of us get to that place. And that's a, that's a really, that only leads to darkness because then it's like, well, man, uh, what do I do now with life? Because God is against me. But when I understand that suffering is not the end, when I understand that and I trust that God is actually at work and doing something, even if I can't see it, then now I can believe that God is going to help me. God is, in fact, helping me even in the midst of my brokenness. You have to know this. Because if we end up concluding, well, God can't be real because I trusted him for this thing and I even prayed about it and, and, I trust, and, and it didn't happen, then that ultimately means that I was trusting in myself, in my understanding about how God works. So then he says, don't be double-minded and unstable. And this double-mindedness, we're going to get into a little bit later, but it's this aspect of going wavering about if I'm trusting God, if I'm not trusting God, if I'm trusting God, am I trusting myself? Am I trusting God? Am I trust oh, I need to help God out. Okay, no, now I'm going to let God do it. And it's just going back and forth, back and forth. And it's unstable. But we can add stability in our lives when we trust the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is probably seen in its best, in its fullness, in Jesus. And that's why... We center the cross as God's wisdom. Now, buckle up for this one. Because you see, the cross actually doesn't just solve 
problems in general, but it speaks to and it clarifies what it is that I'm going through in the world. And it really very much upends the assumptions that I have about how God works and what he's doing in the world. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. According to the scriptures, he lived a sinless life. He taught. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. And it says the son of man had nowhere to lay his head. It says that he was told and accused of crimes that he didn't commit. Wait, the guy that lived perfectly? And then even, okay, well, wait, wait, wait. You know, so God, because he lived perfectly, that means he's going to answer all his prayers the way that he will want to. And then you see in the Garden of Gethsemane, God, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass before me. This is my desire in my flesh and my humanity. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And God's will was revealed the next day as he nailed, was nailed on the cross. And he cries out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He trusted God's plan even in the midst of his death, even though he didn't do anything wrong deserving of the death that he was experiencing. He stood his ground and he suffered and obeyed his father. And he's saying, I'm asking you to do the same thing. The servant is not greater than his master. And so there's something that comes because, praise God, we know that's not the end of the story. Because on Sunday, he resurrects all power in his hand, name above all names, but still with the scars of life, still with the scars of the circumstances. And, and so there's something in the process that God is doing. It says right there in Philippians 2. Because he did not think equality of God was something to be gained, he humbled himself and became a servant even unto death. Yes, even death on the cross. And then he says, you have this same mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The transformation of the cross helps us understand the reality of what wisdom is all about. <laughs> Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. He says, yet among the mature, we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the angels, before the ages of our glory. Verse eight, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his spirit. What Paul is saying here is that there is this other wisdom. But I'm not talking to people who are mature. He's using that sarcastically to say, if you, you're so mature, you don't need to hear from God and his perspective on life because you think you have it all because you read some books because you did a couple years in college. Now you know everything about life. But he's saying, no, no, I'm talking about a deeper wisdom that is at odds with the wisdom of this world. Because you see, in the wisdom of this world, the Pharisees said, well, you know, it's better that Jesus would die and we stay in power than it is for this one man to maybe cause a revolution, to cause a rebellion and cause us to lose the little autonomy we have in our state of Israel. And the wisdom of the world, Judas was like, yo, I need that money. I need that bread. He ain't doing it the way I thought he was. So like, let me just sell him out. The wisdom of the world caused Jesus to be crucified. And so he says, I'm not talking about this wisdom, but I'm talking about a wisdom that is secret and hidden. But what God is doing in you, he says, no eye has seen and no ear has heard what God has in store for you. Yeah. What you do when you trust God in his way, in his methods, is actually transformative. It has a reveal that is beyond what everybody could imagine. So that when Jesus comes back, gleaming in white, walking through walls, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Because this wisdom is deeper and more profound. You know, uh, January started and, um, you know, I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to get back on my fitness thing. But I'm gonna do it differently. I evaluated, I took stock in life and I realized me on my own, just trying to do these things in my room ain't working. So I joined the gym. <laughs> Felt such like a cliche, but okay. But this time I decided I'm, I'm gonna try to use wisdom and I don't sometimes know what I'm doing. So I got with a personal trainer. 
And I remember the first time that we started working out and he had me doing like a bunch of lunges and then these step up things with the kettlebells, right? And my right knee started to hurt and I couldn't really do it. And I knew something every once in a while, my knee starts hurting, which is why I stopped running. And so I just thought he was gonna go up to upper body because that's what I do when my knee hurts. <laughs> and he was like, nah, let's see, uh, try it with one weight. Try it with no weights. Okay, you can do it with no weights. And he's like staring at like my lower leg area. And then he has me do something else. And then at the end of the workout, he says, see, the issue isn't your knee. The issue is that you need to strengthen your calves, your quads, and your hamstrings, everything around the knee. And the only way to do that is by increasing the resistance on those muscle groups. The complete opposite of what I thought, which is why I ended up in that situation, was the exact method that the physical trainer had. Don't you realize Jesus is your physical trainer? And he is saying to you, oh, no, 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 no. You don't need less resistance. You just need to apply the resistance in different ways. You just need to think about it in different ways. Don't stop the workout. Just work on the other things that are weak in your life so that that can pr prove stronger. That's what God is doing in and through us. Jesus is the wisdom of God. And we see through his life, a life of offering himself up to others, a life of sacrifice and a life of death before resurrection, we see the wisdom of God. Where, is God might, where might God might be calling you to die before you can be resurrected? What areas of life do you need to see the resistance and embrace it and just figure out how to modify how I walk through life. We ask God for wisdom. And that's why we pray. <laughs> Monday through Friday, 6.30 in the morning, plug right now. Start your day off right asking God for wisdom with us on Zoom. But then lastly, I wanted to speak on this being, don't be double-minded. Because he uses this illustration of winds and waves, right? Don't be unstable like the winds and the waves. And I thought this was really interesting. And so, um, but I'm not a sailor. Like, I don't get down with boats and stuff like that. So I decided to call a friend who does sail for wisdom. And I said, yo, what does this mean? Like, what, what, explain to me winds and waves and what that has to do with, like, this verse and this imagery he's saying about being double-minded. And my friend Philip, he says, look, the... He ships all over the Caribbean, like he has a boat and he, you know, is living on a boat two weeks, going from Bahamas to Bermuda and all the places. And he says, wind is the main thing that you need when you're sailing. However, you need to recognize that waves are affected by winds. Sometimes storms that are a thousand miles away can impact waves and get choppy at sea. And so even though you need them at times, they're also very dangerous especially when you get crosswinds. And crosswinds happen when it's blowing from several different directions at the same time. You'll be seeing, like, we know what the waves look like on the shore, and it's coming, coming one way calmly, but crosswinds are happening when it's going every way at the same time. And you have to know how to navigate through those crosswinds. And so what he's saying is that essentially being double-minded is like having, creating a storm of dangerous crosswinds in your life. One day I'm trusting God and I'm waiting on him. The next day I'm trusting myself and hearing what the latest fad is and I'm getting crushed by these crosswinds. But instead, if I stand flat-footed in God's word, trusting him, not wavering, then I can actually coast through and the wind can actually be an asset instead of a disadvantage. And that has to do with how I find myself in the winds. Maybe there's a crosswind of conflict and you're trying to figure out like, do I do it my way in my flesh because I know how I act or my trust in God? Maybe you have a crosswind of finances and financial struggle and you're trying to figure out, yo, do I get this money? Do I cut corners? Do I lie, cheat, steal to do it my way? Or do I trust the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? The book of James tells us that true wisdom is more than book smarts. It's more than just knowledge. But Proverbs 1 and verse 7 says, the fear of God 
is the beginning of wisdom.